was this wonderful discussion. Thank you. And this wonderful discussion on um, the role of statistics and data science and the related endeavors in thinking about the public good and generally in realizing hopefully the public good uh, to some extent. And so Ed, uh, many of you have already met in other visits to Exeter, is the head of the Office of Statistics Regulation and it's just wonderful that it's been coming um, every now and then, every few years to Exeter uh, to visit our group and particularly the group uh, within Italians but um, you've been having conversations with some of us over the years around you know, what many of us call the socio-technical approach to um, um, using data for informing policy in a variety of different ways. And of course, the work that the office is doing in that respect is absolutely central. And I don't think I need to put too much emphasis with this group around how central it is, particularly um, given the contemporary British situation in government. And so very, very important to have and any absolutely fantastic team doing the work that they do. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time kind of pontificating what they're doing because I will come in very shortly and tell you yourself. But the way the session is going to work is that he will talk for a little while about their own reflections on the notion of public good in relation to their work, which is what they've been undertaking now since a few months. And so it's great that we managed to intersect with that. And of course, as much feedback as possible from you would be great for them in terms of trying to uh, get them to move forward uh, with this work. And then I'm going to provide a few comments uh, to contextualize and respond to some of the things that um, Ed is raising. And then we're going to open it up and have a very lively debate. So, without further ado, thank you very much Ed, for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and it's really, really good to be here again. Uh, as Sabina said, I've like, come here two or three times, had a really, really good interactions. I think the work you do in the centre uh, is is really powerful and interesting. And for me, as a sort of practitioner in the field of public statistics, it's really useful exchange to get to learn. So I want to talk about the public good. Uh, and my talk will be littered with caveats and cautious statements. Uh, so here's my first one, really a sort of health warning, which is usually when I've come here, I've given you my shield, my shtick. Uh, I've got a kind of a story and I it's kind of quite well honed and I've given it to various audiences. Uh, this is the first time I've given a talk like this. Some of the some of the you know themes are familiar with past talks, but really talking directly about public good, this is the first time. So apologies in advance if this misfires. You are absolutely like my test audience. Uh, so please be um, as brutal as test audiences should be and tell me what you think at the end. So the public good, it is a term that I encounter a lot in my work. I'll explain my work a bit in due course. But the starting point is. These two words, these three words, the public good, the public good. And you hear it a lot. And what I want to do is try and unpack it a little bit, offer some pathways to thinking about the public good in the context of statistics, statistics in the public domain, uh, and also identify a few dead ends. Uh, and perhaps the most sort of important feature of everything that I'm going to say is is this, which I can't now. You have to click on to it to get on Zoom. I have to do that, there we go. Uh, is this, uh, a, a day in the life. So, you know, I work in a field of official statistics. These are statistics which describe the economy through GDP or inflation, or the health of the nation through life expectancy or uh, NHS uh, waiting times, or crime, levels of crime. Uh, and that's often quite an expert discourse. And what we do in, in, in my team is we think a lot about this notion of a day in the life. And what we mean by that is to say that uh, if you imagine an average citizen of the United Kingdom, uh, someone who is going about their ordinary life, imagine their day, uh, and this is the story that we tell, imagine them uh, living in, in this house, waking up in the morning, and half hearing on the radio, as they're you know, getting their breakfast called flakes, that... Um, the latest uh, um, survey, house prices shows that house prices are up. And, you know, the, the, one of the members of the household says casually uh, to her partner, maybe it's time we should think about selling our house. Because her house prices are going up. We've been talking about that for a while. Maybe now is the time. 
Then uh, the family take their children to this school. Uh, they know it's a good school. They've chosen it. They've actively chosen it as a good school. How do they know it's a good school? Well, because everybody says it's a good school. They've also done a little bit of work to look at uh, uh, kind of the Ofsted ratings of the school. They've got sort of good rating. Uh, and somewhere behind that, there's a sense that the statistics show that this school uh, has high attainment levels. So somewhere back in the background of the understanding of that being a good school, there are some statistics. Then uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, average person goes uh, to work uh, and is told by a uh, travel uh, you know, uh, app to avoid this particular bridge because uh, there's a there's roadworks on the bridge and it's taking other routes. So a little bit of data kind of guiding her life, doesn't think about it, just follows the advice as it's being uh, sought. And then, and only then, does she get to her office. In my imagination, she works uh, for a medium-sized enterprise in marketing, and it's her job today to take, um, to do some sales forecasts. And one of the inputs into her sales forecasts are the latest figures about GDP, which she gets from the Office for National Statistics website. She does some kind of formal, structured work using data to inform her, 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 her day job. Uh, obviously, this is like slightly out of proportion because that's going to be like a really big chunk of her day by several of us working on, on that uh, quite sort of structured, thoughtful, um, formalized engagement with, with statistics. And then at the end of the day, uh, she gets home and she finds on her doormat uh, a leaflet saying, come to the local community hall uh, this evening, uh, there's going to be an open public meeting uh, about whether it's safe or not to cite a new waste incinerator in near, near the community. Uh, and this leaflet uh, includes within it things like people who live near uh, waste incinerators have less good health outcomes and some numbers. So throughout this day, you see a kind of engagement in different ways with public statistics. Public statistics are emerging, they're popping up in all sorts of different ways in quite kind of like informal ways, in quite structured ways. This idea here is quite a structured way, people using statistics to make a case. But they're, they're not, they're more than simply a policymaker at the Bank of England taking some figures on inflation and making a decision. Statistics are having a more active life than that. So that's really at the core of everything I'm gonna say is, is, is that idea. I'm gonna unpack it a lot more, uh, but that's the main thing to keep in mind. So then becomes the idea of the public good. And to do this part of the presentation, I just Googled the public good and I thought I'd show you what I found. So any of you work in AI, you'll know that the phrase AI for public good and tech for public good is a really commonplace thing for people to say now. This is just one screenshot. I'm afraid I don't know who this person is. Anybody know who this person is? Nikita looking at? You're not in the room, are you? Are you Nikita? I hope I that would be very good uh, because I've just screenshot your, your piece. Anybody ever heard of Nikki to it? I mean, it's completely random. It's just the first hit when I uh, Googled AI for public good. There are lots. You try this yourself, you'll find a lot of, lot of things. Um, there are lots of other ways that people talk about the public good as well. There is, um, this is just from a website. I was reading it uh, the other week. Uh, ILC is an international kind of science project. And they claim that their goal is to address knowledge gaps to benefit public good. Again, using this term uh, that uh, we see quite a lot. You see it a lot in data for public good. That's another screenshot. Um, I started to think, well, where else might you see it? What other walks of life? And I'm here at a university, so I thought, is there such a thing as a university for public good? It turns out that really this is the strategic vision for the University of New York, a university for public good. Uh, Again, this term cro cropping up. I then started to think about other places, lawyers, public good. And then I started to like play with it a little bit. But well, what, what's the kind of most ridiculous thing I could think of? I'm a big fan of cricket. Can you find cricket for the public good? You can. Mm -hmm. Cricket, the question is cricket for the public good. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go crazy with this. This is the, my best, is uh, a seminar admitting <laughs> for the public good, which is like great. So I hope I'm establishing for you that this term, the public good, is used in many and multiple ways. Um, and this would be quite a good idea for us to unpack it and think about what it actually means. Uh, so I'm going to do that in three ways. Uh, I'm going to explore a socio-technical pathway, as things have already mentioned, what that might mean, a conceptual pathway, and then a regulatory evidence pathway. 
I said I'd have plenty of caveats. Um, a really important caveat is everything I'm saying is based on my work, which has been official statistics. This is very emergent thinking. Uh, and as I say, I'm suggesting pathways and then some dead ends as well. So why does this matter for me when my work, I'm the head of the Office of Statistics Regulation? Well, this is on our act, so the Statistics and Registration Services Act, and it says our objective, the thing that we set up to do, is promoting and safeguarding the production and publication of official statistics that serve the public good. So this is back in 2007, public good is hardwired into our legal framework. The act gives hardly any guidance as to what that means, a tiny bit, but hardly any, not any useful guidance anyway. Um, in terms of our day-to-day -day work, we do three things. We spend a lot of time looking at how statistics are produced, and I have an example later of our work there. And what I mean by that is uh, when uh, there's an estimate made of the rate of inflation, um, how has that been compiled? Has that been compiled in accordance with good principles, uh, sound practice, um, is it reliable? Is it is it of sufficient quality? So we do lots of lots of work there. Uh, the thing we're probably most in the public eye uh, uh, is how statistics are used in public debate, and I have some examples here of where statistics are being used in public and uh, potentially misused, and we step in and highlight the appropriate uh, interpretation. And I think I've talked about that a couple of times before when I've been in the Exeter. And the third thing we do is what I'm doing here today, we develop a better understanding of public statistics. So we do those three things, all underpinned by a kind of practice. And as I talk, I think we will get a feeling for what these things mean uh, in practice. So, so the first pathway to understanding the public good I want to explore is a socio-technical pathway. I'm sure there are many people in this room who have got a better idea of what socio-technical means uh, than I do, but I'm gonna, Try my understanding uh, and then start to apply it um, in practice. So, socio technical, I think, is a contrast between, but uh, against a notion of technology and society which is purely technical. It says that the way to understand progress and advancement is to understand the dynamics of what technology does, to understand it in functional and technical terms. Socio technical says, actually, that is to misunderstand how technology uh, influences and impacts society, because technology is always interfacing with people, with humans, with humans uh, as individuals and humans in groups and, 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 in, and in society. And that interface between technology and humans as social animals is what creates all the interesting stuff. And it's what leads to very interesting analysis of the way that, for example, uh, data, big data, can um, have very differential impact depending on whether you're a, uh, in a marginalized group or not. That's a sort of socio-technical way of thinking. It's thinking about interface of technology and data with society. So thinking about the public good through that lens uh, gets us back to this. And I think it really highlights that in my story, if we want to understand the public good, if we just focus in on this kind of very conscious formalized space where there's sort of a, a process of, uh, you know, what you might call kind of um, slow thinking in Daniel Kahneman terms, conscious applied thoughts. It's probably going to be a dead end because you're going to miss all these other interactions, right? All these other ways in which people, uh, individuals, uh, families, communities, community, uh, and actually just big groups as well are interacting with data and statistics and thinking about it. So to think socio-technically forces us to think more widely than this very kind of expert domain of, of, of conscious uh, consciousness. That's all I'll say about socio-technical. I'll be fascinated to hear your thoughts. I'm sure there are people here who have spent more time thinking about this than I have. There is another dead end here as well. You might say in terms of socio-technical things, well, the best thing to do is to go and ask people, go and ask people what they think. And in my world, we actually do do that. We uh, commissioned NATSEN, the National Center for Social Research, to do a survey uh, called Public Confidence in Official Statistics. Uh, you might say that's quite a good way of finding out whether statistics are serving the public good, is to ask people. And we get kind of pretty good answers. Like 82% of people agree that official statistics are generally accurate. So really, really positive. And there are quite a few other results like that. The reason this is a dead end, of course, is that this is a stated preference. Um, 
In technical terms, there's quite a lot of non-response. So the 82 percent is able to express an opinion. And there's also, of course, the difference between stated and revealed. Uh, another and much more challenging piece of work is by the Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence, who asked people what they understood by economic statistics terms. Terms that we might think of as being relatively simple, like unemployment or inflation. And um, what this tended to find was that people not only were not sure that they really understood what those terms mean, they also felt that terms like unemployment are used by government to kind of bamboozle and confuse. Uh, in, this, in this work, uh, current, anybody know the current rate of unemployment in the UK? It's a good test. Has a guess. 5%, any any other 14, 14 7 or 8, 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. Uh, and the reason they think that is that they observe in their lives uh, a great deal of um, a great deal of worklessness. They see people around them in their communities that they uh, think of as being uh, work workless. And then the experts, economic statistics experts, say, "Aha! But that's not what we mean by employment. What we mean by employment isn't people who don't have a job. We mean people who want a job and don't have one." Uh, the uh, economically active, as it's called, uh, patronizingly called, and the public say, "Well, we just don't trust that. That sounds like that sounds like you're just trying to bamboozle us and make things seem better than they are." So I think, to me, these stated preferences are really, really good, but we should take them with a pinch of salt. So that's why I think it's a dead end. One end, one setting which is not a dead end. There's one finding to which all of these caveats don't apply, and which is absolutely rock solid, and it's this one. 96% agree it's important for your body to speak out against misuse. You can take that absolutely right. I think it's a bit low, don't you? I think that should be actually more like 98, 99%. Um, no, I'm kidding. That's that's uh, we were very happy to see that result of the solve. My second pathway into the public good is uh conceptual. Thank you. Well, if, if if you want to be socio-technical, but it's actually quite hard. Um, without doing lots of participant observation. Maybe we need some concepts to guide us. And I've thought of um, five things here, I've got five things that I want to want to share as to what people might mean by the public good. The first is very long standing idea of utilitarianism. In other words, what is the public good is the greatest benefit to the greatest number of, of people. Uh, and that's alive and well. I don't know if any of you know the Royal Society which is the uh, UK's National Academy for Science, they have the notion embedded into their um, sort of strategy of uh, seeking to support human flourishing, which I really interpret as a sort of utilitarian idea of making as many humans uh, live their best lives as, as they could. So I think that's quite an interesting pathway to explore. I think I always find the human flourishing language a little bit tricky in the sense that what does it mean to flourish? I think it sort of just, you know, defers a a kind of bigger debate as to what, what, what you need, but I think it's quite helpful. Second thing you quite often find people talking about is an environmental or social notion of the public good. But what is serving the public good is something which creates a more sustainable world. It's obviously very driven by uh, a kind of quite prevailing uh, uh, consensus that the way that mankind is interacting with our natural world and our natural resources is not sustainable. And therefore, what serves the public good is something which, which creates sustainability. Uh, I think that's really helpful and good. We don't use it um, because it, uh, in a sense, there's another, a whole bunch of other domains that we deal with. Like, I think it's hard to think about this uh, in relation to, say, statistics on um, crime, uh, which is a very important thing that people want to understand. How that's environmental, I think, is a bit of a stretch. And then I've encountered quite recently two further kind of domains where people talk about public good really interestingly. One is what you're all engaged with, which is higher education. There's an academic called Simon Marvinson who writes about the sort of the uh, the idea of higher education, 
And he points out that most of the ways that policy talks about higher education is in a very uh, transactional and sort of um, privately beneficial way. That the purpose of higher education is to educate people so that they can be uh, effective, productive employees. Um, so you get degrees, and there's lots of this stuff about how to get an economics degree is better than getting a ballet degree because you, know, you, you sort of um, earn more if you're an economics student. And what um, he says is, well, that's a very private interest. That's a private good notion of, uh, of universities. A public good notion of university is to say, well, you get all of those benefits, but there has to be something extra, which is about contributing more broadly to, to society. And university's contribution is uh, a good of knowledge uh, and a good of contribution of uh, new, additional, fresh insights into public discourse. Really interesting. That really appeals to me as a way of thinking about it, that distinction between private benefit and public, uh, public benefit. Um, also, growing, the, growing up in the world of uh, accountancy, there's, there's a new uh, trend. I'm an accountant, so I'm familiar with this today. Um, when I was being trained as an accountant, the, um, the prevailing orthodoxy was accounts help the world because a good set of accounts helps an investor make a good decision. It's like the investor interest. The investor can make a good decision and therefore in some way resources are allocated appropriately uh, and so on. Increasingly, uh, there's a challenge to that view, which is to say that's too narrow because the investor interest is, is you know, pretty naturally a private interest. Um, you know, benefits that investor. The public interest goes broader, and I just was reading this over the weekend, and I thought it was really interesting, which is um, talking about reinventing accounting with a broader, clearer, more realistic definition uh, that accounting creates a better world. Um, and it says the purpose is broader than just information for investors. Um, it, it's helping society have the accountability to address big questions. Uh, I don't quite know what they mean by big questions, but um, they're very clear that accounting has a social purpose as well as a technical, uh, technical purpose. So I think, again, in this world, as in the, what I was just about the universities, you're talking about a sense of getting beyond private interests into what might be called public interests. <laughs> And the final thing, again, I was reading at the weekend, is um, the idea of the public sphere, uh, which is, um, I think it originates in, in people like Habermas, but again, you all like everything, you'll know this better than me. But Habermas said, one of the unique features of the Industrial Revolution was the creation for the first time of a public sphere in which people would communicate, not with each other, but with an idealized audience. Uh, and he identified all the B spaces, triggered by printing presses and so on, which created this public sphere. And I think that's a really interesting idea. And I think it is very, very pertinent to thinking about a contemporary way information is used in the contemporary world. Uh, I think you probably want to say public spheres. You might want to say there will be a multiple public spheres. But I found that a really interesting uh, pathway. A uh, piece of work I was reading defined public sphere thus. It's a group of people who come together outside the auspices of the state in order to discuss matters of public concern on an equal footing and which function to generate public legitimacy. So I think that's quite an interesting pathway. So I have five ways here. Uh, I'm not going to say which I, I prefer. Then they all offer us a way of thinking about this thing called public good, which gets us beyond just saying public good is a good thing. <laughs> it gets, it's that helps us un unpack it. There is one dead end I want to uh, highlight, which is, I don't know if there are any economists in the room, but I think those of you who are economists might be hearing another term, which is public goods. It's a very um, well-practiced piece of economic analysis, is that you get different kinds of goods, um, private goods, club goods, common goods, and public goods. The public goods have um, these characteristics of being non-excludable, um, so you can't sort of privatise them and sell them in a way that uh, you can only get them if you pay for them. And they're non rivalrous My consumption of the good does not in any way inhibit your, your consumption. So an example would be air. Um, I can breathe the air, you can breathe the air, we can both breathe the air, and nobody can charge me. Nobody can privatise the air, uh, create property rights around the air, and then charge me for it. 
Uh, the reason I'm not entirely sure about this notion of public is, is that I think it I think it doesn't really, I think it's quite good on what we mean by public, but I'm not sure if it really helps us with what we mean by, by goods. Because in some ways, I think a computer virus might be non-excludable and non-viable as uh, I think it might meet the definition of being an economic public good, but I don't think it would be a public good in the sense of being something which is beneficial to society. So I think the economic concept is interesting, but probably a bit of a dead end. If there are any economists in the room, do debate me on that when we get to the Q&A. Um, and now to get to the third kind of pathway, which is much less conceptual and much more practical. I kind of thought, well, in a way, day to day, me and my team dealing with statistics in public discourse. So what is it that emerges from that work? What is that telling us about the world that we um, the public good that we live in? So I'm going to have about four or five examples. I'm just going to talk about them. One of the biggest demands for us to um, step in and uh, uh, form a regulator review was around exam algorithms. I don't know how many of you were in the UK in 2020, but in 2020, school children didn't take exams as they traditionally would do. Um, instead, uh, and that's because of COVID, instead they, they were awarded grades effectively by an algorithm which calculated the most likely grade that each uh, student would get. Um, and it became a huge controversy. Um, I've got some of the, I'm not sure if you can see them, but these are some screenshots of students who are protesting. Uh, students, not statistics. Uh, your algorithm doesn't know me. Uh, algorithms, three exclamation marks. Um, I think what this is really, uh, what was really fascinating is this is a, sort of a public reaction to automated decision making where the public, the students, felt as though they either were denied a voice or more that they were, their interests were significantly harmed. So we were called in and people said, something's gone wrong with statistics here. Students, not statistics. Your algorithm doesn't know me. Can you, can you help? Uh, and we did a very big piece of work. Uh, and I think, Samina, we, we did um, get your advice at the bit Yeah. Um, so this is telling us something about statistics in it, you know, so the socio it's so purely socio technical that these are individual members of society who've been impacted by something technical and how they, they reacted. The next example is uh, much more recent. This is the autumn of this year. Um, every quarter, uh, the Office for National Statistics publish an estimate of gross domestic product. Uh, what they also do is they revise their estimates. Mm -hmm. A very standard practice in any statistics office in the world will do this. They'll do the latest estimate based on kind of a first cut of the data, more data come in, they do their revision. Um, what happened in uh, September of this year is that they revised reasonably significantly their estimate of the size of the economy during the lockdown years, 2020, 20, particularly 2021. Uh, and they said that actually the economy recovered faster from the pandemic than they had originally thought. Uh, and that, that, that led to significant revision. And they got hammered by it uh, by, by the media. The FT said, we need an urgent inquiry. The economists said, British uh, statisticians fix a blunder. And the, um, I think this is telling us something, right? It's telling us about something about the way people attach huge uh, weight to these signs of statistics in public life and feel quite aggrieved if those numbers change, uh, even though both of these institutions are full of experts who understand completely that the numbers inevitably will change because they're provisional estimates. Nevertheless, when it happened, they were furious and lots of people wrote to us and we, we uh, were asked to step in and give a view on this blunt, so-called uh, blunder. The second, like, really a practical example of the public good statistics may potentially not be observed. Third example, this is quite, I, I have talked about this quite a lot before, um, I mean, maybe not here, but this is a very well known example. Um, this man apparently used to be the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and he um, was fond of saying uh, in autumn of um, 2021 and February 22 that there are 430,000 more people in employment than before the pandemic began, arguing therefore that employment had recovered. Um, 
rather unfortunately for him, if you actually looked at total employment, uh, this is December to February 2020, before the pandemic began, and it's just a point of it's making the statement. And the green line is the net change in employment, and it's clearly a fall. Uh, that's naught, that's an increase, that's a decrease. This line is clearly a fall. Uh, what was going on is that he was just looking at this, which is full time employees, not factoring in that the self employed and part time employees had declined quite significantly. So the net effect was, 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 was a fall. And it's no mystery as to why full time employees increased because lots of people wanted to get on furlough schemes, and it was a better thing to be on a furlough scheme if you were not self employed. Therefore, we had to step in. People, people were furious about this. Like this is kind of like clearly misleading. We were asked to step in again. This is telling us something about public, um, the public desire for truthfulness in the use of, of statistics. A, another example. Um, this is not an inflation tweet. Well, I suppose it is in one way, but uh, this is um, it's about inflation. So this is a very famous dodgy graphic. Uh, it's nothing not produced by official statistics. It was uh, discovered by a um, data scientist who had seen online somebody doing presentation showing average, average female height per uh, country uh, with these uh, giant uh, Latvians at five foot five inches, absolutely dwarfing the South Africans and the Indians at five foot two, five foot one. And of course, it's completely misleading, not only because of the growth of sizes uh, on the body, but also if it starts at five foot. So it's massively exaggerating uh, uh, the, the, the difference. It's a very famous example of how you know, data visualizations can, can significantly mislead. Um, and you might think that government is far too sophisticated to fall into that blunder, but I'm afraid you'd be wrong because here is a tweet on inflation produced by the UK government. Uh, showing the fall in inflation between October 2022 and January 2023, a nice downward curve, uh, but unfortunately it begins at 8%, the massively exaggerating, um, making it look like it's around a 30% fall um, when it's more like a 10% fall. Uh, really poor, poor practice. People got really upset about this, this misrepresentation. They complained to us about it. Uh, we were asked to step in. Um, so that's a Good example of what people care about. Um, and this is my final example of what people care about. I don't know if any of you live in Wales, but in Wales recently, um, they've moved over to in pretty much every urban area. The speed limit is now 20 miles an hour, cutting it back from 30 miles an hour. And uh, on uh, every doormat in every house in Wales, a but they received a leaflet. British government wants to promote this. They sent a leaflet around with a huge mail shot, and it and it had um, lots of useful information, which is if you see street lights in twenty miles an hour, uh, and a little bit of survey of information. Most people support the speed limit. And then this: most journeys will be around one minute longer. Um, footnote, uh, and people who were you know experiencing this. The lived experience of drivers in Wales are like it feels like it's a lot more than one day long you know. So they 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 came to us and said, "Can you verify this one minute long claim?" And um, well, to cut all sorts of short, we couldn't. And I won't go into the the, the details of it. Uh, it was extremely hard to see how the one minute long claim was uh, sourced. Uh, there was a very very big technical report in that. There's some. Analysis underneath the technical report, if you eventually dig down about four layers, um, you could probably find where they might have got it from. So it's really um, not very well presented. But the point is, this is what I'm getting to, is people saw this, it clashed with their lived experience, and they said, we want to understand. We want to understand this. You know, our, our socio-technical scepticism is triggered when we hear one minute longer, and therefore we want to know where that number is coming. In all of these cases, we uh, we uh, we did step in. Um, so this was the letter that we wrote to the Prime Minister, uh, which got a lot of press coverage. This is our report on exam algorithms. Um, this is stats experts, that's us. Go and sign the one claim. That's us on the GDP revisions. My favorite of these is the uh, Treasury tweet, you know, the tweet which was like exaggerating inflation. 
Tokens Treasury slam by watchdog and misleading inflation tweet. I love this bit. It says, a watchdog which cracks down on dodgy stats, um, which I've decided I think we should get printed up on this. <laughs> <laughs> like really, really, really. It's quite good, aren't they? They're quite, I mean, we sort of say we're here to serve the public good or something. They say, cracks down on dodgy stats. Very good. So what do we take from all of this? These practical examples, sort of, you know, I think it's a reveal of practice. Can we take the insight that data subjects aren't just passive recipients of decisions that affect them. If they've got skin in the game, they will speak up. And GDP, uh, if you're basing your understanding of the world on this single iconic number, it's probably quite a good idea, uh, idea to understand its contingency, uh, be aware of the uncertainty. Uh, both the PM on employment, the 430,000, and the misleading tweet, uh, I think they're telling us don't present a partial picture to imply that things are better than they are. I think that's what is consistent across those, those things. What is being revealed is people don't like the sense that they're not getting a full picture. And the Wales point is um, enable people to access and understand evidence so they can make up their own mind. So I think that's really quite a useful set of lessons to help us make sense of, uh, in a world in which statistics and data are, are kind of ubiquitous, how to think about how they can serve the public good. And I sort of summarize all of this into say, make sure that the insight that statistics provide is clear. It's clear what they mean and what they don't mean. That's what I take from that. Uh, there is one dead end that I very briefly want to touch on. Um, and this could be a whole presentation in its own right. I quite often hear when I give to groups, people say, well, isn't the problem that the public has low statistical literacy? Uh, we heard that enough that we decided to do a, a literature review, which you'll find here, yeah, that's the link, um, there's a screenshot from it. And what we concluded was this claim that the problem is low statistical literacy needs to be unpacked quite a lot. Because what does it mean? Does low statistical literacy mean that people have not very good levels of mathematical skill, low foundational numeracy, as it's called? So which answer is, yes, there's plenty of evidence that people have not got very high levels of numeracy. And I can quote the various surveys which demonstrate this. But that's not the same as saying people have poor knowledge of statistical terms, which is probably also true. My example of unemployment, so relatively specific statistical meaning, people are very skeptical about that. Or does it mean that people lack an ability to critically evaluate information? Now there, the evidence is really, really mixed because you find some evidence of people being pretty um, uh, gullible, I suppose you'd say, in the face of misinformation. And yet you have this growing body of work on inoculation experiments, which show that if people are given not very much uh, guidance training, they could be actually really quite skilled and quite good at skeptically picking between things which are reliable and unreliable. Um, so we concluded from all of this that don't ever say problem is low statistical literacy. You might say this particular issue is hard to understand for people with lower levels of numeracy. That'd be a more kind of uh, accurate claim. You might say that oh, there's a statistical term being used here that people don't understand, uh, but I'd be very wary of saying that people are not, not um, uh, good at critically, critical thinking. I think there's, there's evidence that, that they are. So, in, so we say, this is our conclusion, statistical literacy is not a deficit that needs to be fixed, but it's something which is very fair and very in the context of the benefit. So I'm not going to be very happy if you say more problem with statistical literacy. I think that is a dead end in this conversation. So I'm now going to bring it all together. My last couple of minutes, and we can we can uh, uh, open up. Um, I've like bombarded you with lots of ideas. A day in the life idea, my lessons. It's all kind of uh, it's all kind of piling up. I've got some concepts which I can explain very well about you know utilitarianism and so on. What is it? What does it all mean? But what we have done is developed, uh, me and my team, iteratively, the following definition to help us think, are official statistics serving the public good? Well, to do that, they have to be public assets that provide insight, which allows them, the statistics, to be used widely for informing understanding and shaping action. So three, um, three basic components there. Uh, 
First is they have to be public assets. And this draws very much on this idea of public sphere. I won't go into this, but we have, oh, sorry, no, that's the right button. We have lots of sort of sub uh, criteria there. Um, but essentially, it's it's kind of a little bit of the economic idea of uh, non viable to non excludable, but unpacks it much more in this public sphere sense of um, how accessible uh, in for what conversation in what context. So we, 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 we draw on that. Secondly, it definitely draws on our regulatory experience. Recall all those examples I gave of the way in which people feel as though their insight is being denied because they're, you know, the, there's a misleading presentation of the graph. Uh, their interests are being, um, you know, trampled uh, in, in other ways. They're not getting access to information. Um, again, we uh, unpack this in lots of ways, which I won't go into. Um, and then the third is uh, informing understanding and shaping action. And this draws back into the day in the life perspective, um, going beyond uh, simply thinking of statistics as something that experts use in an expert discourse, but something which is about um, more broad public understanding and shaping action. And again, I'm sorry, I don't have time to go into We have like sub definitions, which we share slides, I guess. So that's what I propose. Uh, now, the original pitch was I was going to talk about um, AI and data science, and you'd be pleased I haven't known next to nothing about the subject. But I do want to say that what I've done here, I think, might be relevant to AI and data science in some ways. So, a lot of caveats here. But I think the public good definition we've developed may have some wider relevance. Firstly, notice that it's not normative. It doesn't say something serves the public good when it helps us resolve the climate crisis. It doesn't kind of have a sense of us defining what the good is. It focuses on the function that is being performed, uh, not the um, uh, not particular type of, of, of value set. Uh, secondly, I'm not sure this is um, how relevant this is, but it's really important in our world. It's not naive because it doesn't require good decisions. In the world of official statistics, Often people say, well, statistics are good because they help government make better decisions. Uh, and I don't think that's really, I think it's a very naive view of how policy making works. Um, statistics can be good, even if government doesn't use them to make good decisions. So I don't think it's naive. It focuses on outcomes, uh, but as I say, in a constrained way, the outcome is supporting knowledge um, and insight. Uh, it's not supporting a particular, say, you know, uh, something is good if it achieves a certain level of economic well-being. Like uh, I really like the fact it's embedded in the idea of public spheres, and I also think that definition is relevant to quite a wide range of user groups, including marginalised groups. I think that's very important. So I wonder whether the ideas that I've put up here could actually draw on this, it would be drawn on into the AI and data science context. It's a constrained outcome focus, the idea of public spheres, uh, the, the avoidance of normativity, the avoidance of saying we will define something as being good if it achieves this particular quantified outcome. Um, discuss. I'd be fascinated to know your thoughts because that's the bit I wasn't sure about. I've all the other stuff in my day job. This is much less my day job, which is the more used. That's it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so I'll take just a few minutes to add a few comments on uh, some of the things that Ed was talking about and then open up for discussion more generally and come back to me then, uh, but I'll try to take as little time as possible. Um, I suppose one of the things I wanted to call attention to in, in this discussion, also the role of the office um, in this discussion, is the fact that you know, you really exemplify this really interesting dialogical mode of response, right? So this is a situation where you're checking and verifying, and you're specifically called to check and verify on situations where there's a well-defined controversy. And I think this makes actually quite a big difference to how one may want to approach the notion of public good in that particular context. And because, and I think maybe something that you may want to emphasize more also as an office, um, because it does provide you precisely with the opportunity to step into um, you know, what you may want to call a public sphere or certainly a well-defined debate 
where you can actually respond in a way that is um, not only proportional to, but actually cognizant of the type of discussion that is happening and also potential implications, because some of them are already apparent. Right? And um, I, I think there's quite a few examples of senior organizations doing this, especially in other countries, where there is a kind of government-sponsored office that is in charge of this, which are very much kind of civil society kind of organizations, right? Groups of patients, um, people who are, you know, um, retired medics. And, like it's, it's very common to find all sorts of organizations. I'm organizing a piece of this information in Leiden in, in three weeks, and we have a few representatives of these groups coming to talk about what their role in, you know, informing journalists or pinging a newspaper, you know, whenever they see that there's something not quite right in, say, some government statistics is, is, um, is. And so I think there's something really interesting about thinking about those interventions as dialogue. And also thinking about what happens when that dialogue is much more difficult to locate uh, because the institutions that are producing the statistics are actually maybe either not thinking about themselves in dialogue with anybody at all, or maybe thinking about what one may think of as the wrong publics or not quite the right publics for the kind of play that they're putting up. And also, I think it's very interesting because it raises the uh, significance of your office, in fact, having not only enough authority kind of um, you know, legitimacy really given to it by the public and by government to actually be able to have this checking role, uh, but is also trusted to have a sort of good interpretation of what the public good is in those cases, right? Which will be contextualized, which will be, uh, you know, but of course, you know, as you would expect we have that discussion many times, I have my very strong doubts as to how normative that actually is. Mm -hmm. um, cuz i think by the time you step into each and every one of those discussions you are pressed to say that you didn't take actually a start that was also normative at the same time uh, but in any case this is interesting and it becomes particularly interesting that remark because of course we are working on the background and many people here are working on these kinds of issues um, of a situation where science itself and scientific research including statistics is actually losing legitimacy or one may argue that there's lots of different ways in which debate around science are developing in that uh, direction. Some of this, this all this question about reproducibility, the fact that we are not entirely sure what the criteria are within the sciences to actually check on the quality of the work, uh, both methodologically and in terms of its results. And um, this shadow that is cast over science, very often with very good reason, around the kind of discriminatory practices that are happening there, you know, gender discrimination, racial discrimination, this huge shadow of uh, colonialism over what counts as best science. And all of this is actually creating, uh, or at least contributing to some sense of alienation of a certain kind of publics. And I think that immediately impacts the, how we define public interest, right? So um, things like uh, vaccines being mm -hmm. uh, you know, a tool for public interest, an absolutely obvious example. There are, I mean, I've heard certainly lots of arguments around vaccines being only good for some, and being associated with a certain elitist way of thinking about uh, the results of research. Um, and actually, some of those arguments, interestingly, uh, reflect uh, what we, one may call very important statistics about, in fact, how biased clinical trials tend to be and how limited the population samples on which these this, um, this studies, in some cases at least, are carried out, that then kind of gets transformed into a reason to distrust uh, the scientific product um, in other ways. And of course, all of these debates are happening. We're trying to document many of them here. And acknowledging that those debates are happening really doesn't easily translate some formulas for what to do about them, as we all know, and, and, and in fact, um, what the continuing effects of this may be. There's also all this ghost behind this discussion, which was apparent in every one of your slides, but of course, kind of lies a bit in the background. We discussed it also in other times around what does it mean to weaponize statistics and, and, and particularly these questions of uncertainty, the weaponization of uncertainty, which is becoming um, you know, people, something that people are very, very good at. Speaking about statistical literacy, uh, you see a lot of different groups acquiring really quite astonishing yeah. levels of um, um, you know, what we call AI or data science um, literacy in being able to manipulate statistics for particular ends, right? And so um, there is all of that um, question about what is happening. And of course, this constant issue that we unfortunately uh, know all about, all around, uh, of thinking about 
statistical results and more generally scientific research as some sort of garant of truth, which of course becomes a, the perfect pedestal from which you can kind of uh, cut down any legitimacy that science may ever have just by pointing out that some things are not quite um, as um, certain as you may expect. Um, now, I just wanted to make a couple of remarks given this kind of background that hopefully can help us with the discussion. Um, one is this question around what then is the role of statisticians, maybe a little bit more broadly, given that you've done uh, work on this also, uh, beyond your own office in this whole landscape. Um, one may argue that statisticians actually have a role that is just as important as journalists at the moment. I mean, they have a very, very important mediated role socially as people who have the expertise and you know, they're paid really uh, to go from one world to the other, to kind of be able to translate what some results may look like for much wider publics. Um, and whether statisticians actually uh, conceptualize their roles in this way as mediators of very complex evidential landscapes, um, I wonder. Uh, but this is something that I think comes up more and more, particularly with the advent of, um, you know, at least, the mass emergence of generative AI, and so this um, you know, speeding up of uh, data analysis in ways that actually provides more and more and more and more statistical claims everywhere, and um, where it's very, very difficult to evaluate uh, the value of, of all of these. And um, I'm doing some work with Cassandra Bird, sitting right there, uh, thinking about what it means to actually do uh, statistical work in that sense, and particularly these discussions around uncertainty, how do we understand them? I mean, it's our impression that very often questions of uncertainty almost get used as a figure um, to think about, um, you know, let's quantify uncertainty and kind of measure it and sort of be able to control it somehow and therefore resolve all these questions around what the public good conception may be behind these assessments. And this, of course, serves very much these ideas of, you know, what people in our field call mechanized um, or mechanical objectivity, the idea that you can get machines to do stuff for you and therefore this kind of level of automation will make everything much more objective and trustworthy. And um, I think, yeah, this is um, a situation where um, reclaiming back the non-mechanized view of what does it mean to make an uncertainty assessment and how that actually becomes uh, very much imbued with decisions about what to take the public good to be uh, behind that assessment is very important. And I mean, again, in AI, there's so many examples of that, the idea of hallucinations, you know, that's such an interesting term for um, outputs that make basically zero sense, but are kind of, they make sense within the machinery of AI because they fill certain gaps where we actually don't have evidence. I mean, it, how these need to be calibrated through human scrutiny and meaning making, I mean, this, I think, keeps speaking back to uh, the role that statisticians need to take in all of this and how important it is to have a sense of uh, what the public good may look like. Final remark, again, another elephant in the room here, but you did um, refer to this uh, every now and then, this question about the public and the private um, on the back of that, uh, especially in respect to notion of public good. Um, I think by now we're all pretty well aware of, of the fact that how public and private interests or public and private goods it may be understood doesn't align in a neat way with notions of government and commercial entities. Um, it's very, very clear uh, that this is not happening at the moment. Uh, but I think it certainly leaves us in a very interesting situation as to what the relationship with the private between the public and the private needs to be, and actually quite concretely in statistics projects and in checking exercises. <laughs> How do we think about the financing of those? How do we think about the ways in which they need to be governed and set up? And I was just providing evidence for this really big um, consultation that the EU is doing at the moment, the Commission on the Role of AI in Research. And one of the main things I think that's coming out of that set of conversations is the fact that at least when it comes to thinking about the role of statistics, data science, and AI for research purposes, uh, we really don't have a clue what the relationship between uh, public and private entities needs to be. And there needs to be a reimagination, a complete reimagination of how these PPP kind of uh, partnerships need to look like, because one thing that we seem to be able to determine by now is that many of the formats we are familiar with are not working well at all, precisely because they don't provide a, a space for even discussing what the ideal public good may be that underpins this kind of collaborations, if there is any to be found or, or, or sought or not just evoked rhetorically. 
So I got a little bit of this. I just wanted to give a few more um, ideas to come back to some of the things that I've um, said. And so if you want to say something very briefly, or otherwise we just open up for a discussion as you want. Uh, give you a couple of things, that's, if that's okay. That, thank you so you very much. Um, shall I sit here? Is that, is that that's okay? That's fine. Can you sit? Can you see at the... Oh, oh, yeah, okay. 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 Thanks for the point. Um, so I'll say something about... Uh, You've talked about us uh, with calls to check on worldwide controversies, uh, and that makes it very, uh, the work very targeted. Um, and I'm going to link that into normativity as well. I'll say something very briefly about weaponization, uh, and uh, I think I put something very briefly about uncertainty. So you're absolutely right that all of the things I've talked about have this quality of there being a and an existing controversy into which our authority is called to play. That's that's not the only mode we have. We do have some sort of um, kind of more proactive modes where we're some more upstream. I haven't talked about that at all today, but there, there's stuff that we do where we we are not. There's not a well-defined controversy. Um, funnily enough, I was just talking to my team earlier today. You'll be interested in this, uh, Sean. Um, about whether we should do more to highlight the value of statistics on health inequalities on the grounds that when people in the public sphere talk about health in the UK, they often talk about how long people are waiting in a queue uh, or um, how long they're waiting in an in a, in a accident emergency department. Uh, but there's a much bigger story about public health, which the statistics reveal that doesn't get so much airtime. And that's an example of us almost there being an absence of controversy where we think there should be one. Um, so it's not it's not just not universal. But I think the point about being called into controversy for us is that the way we conceptualize it is there is a controversy about what these statistics say or don't say, or what they do or don't do. Our role is not actually to take sides in that. Our role is to say what the statistics do and don't say, in our view. Uh, and for that to be an authoritative um, contribution to the debate, but we're not, if you look at what we say, we very rarely say, you have got this wrong. Uh, we say, this was said, this is what we interpret this thing is actually saying. Um, and uh, the theory of change there is that if we provide the extra evidence, it enriches the debate in the public sphere, but it doesn't make us ourselves participants in, in the debate. I think this, I know what you're all thinking, well, that's a little bit of a sleight of hand, because uh, you really are, and we know we really are, we know we really are, but the point is we're very consciously presenting uh, information in the way that it's there for anybody to take and use and harness themselves for their own debate, as opposed to us uh, actively saying well, something, something's wrong. I think that the inflation tweet is probably at the extreme end of us saying that's just wrong. That's that's quite a rare case of us saying that's just wrong. Normally, we're much more um, in the space of saying here is some extra information based on our, on our authority. So whilst there is a dialogic space that we're entering into, we seek to do so in a non-dialogic way, if that makes sense. And I think that is one of the most successful, one of the ways we're successful is because we avoid thereby overtly politicizing ourselves. Mm -hmm. what, what enables us to criticize Boris Johnson is that it doesn't look like Boris Johnson. Even though everybody says they're criticizing about Boris Johnson, what we are presenting to the world is, isn't that interesting you're talking about that thing Boris Johnson said, here's what the statistics say, make up your own mind. So I think that's really, really kind of an important distinction. Um, weaponizing statistics, are, are, I think it's a real feature of contemporary discourse that is, is hugely problematic. Um, uh, just to give a really current example in the UK, the Prime Minister gave these five pledges uh, about asylum backlogs and about a number of small boats crossing the channel. Uh, and each of those is really easy to track in numbers, whether from the point that he made the pledge to now, what's happened. Um, but the way that the communication goes is actually not saying here's the trend line as to where things are going, it's to say either him saying, I have six, you know, 
today's number shows up successfully in that line, like dropping in a number, usually not with the full context, or his opponent saying today's number show you completely fail. And it's a, it's such a broken conversation. It's such a broken conversation. I think a lot of our work is called in when 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 these 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 numbers become weaponized, they become dropped. In fact, I have a rule of thumb that if something is if, if a single number is re, re, used repeatedly over and over again, you can be almost certain that, that, that by the end it will have lost its context and then it will start to be misleading. Um, so I, I think you're right to pick up on that. And then the final thing. I wanted to say was about uncertainty um, and the fig leaf of uncertainty. And you know, I guess I'd be interested to hear more about that. Uh, you know, we encourage as much as possible for people to recognize, acknowledge, and accept uncertainty, even if that sounds like hopelessly idealistic, uh, maybe even naive to say when people are using, are using statistics, they should recognize the uncertainties which surround them. Uh, it sounds naive because people believe that communicating to the public, you have to have simple, clear, unequivocal messages. Um, but I just think those communication experts are wrong, actually. I think they're wrong. I think that if you communicate to the public uh, in ways which don't treat the public like idiots, actually the public will respect it. Uh, and I think there's, there is evidence from the pandemic that communicators who were clear about the uncertainties tended to be the ones who, who were more on who more trust was conferred than the ones who, who, who don't. But I'm interested in the uncertainties of thinking if you know, I wasn't quite sure what meant by that. Uh, but I do think uncertainty is something that we champion, recognizing uncertainties. I think, yeah, one final point. There's always two kinds of uncertainty. There's the there's the uncertainty as to what the number is. Like a statistician will say you've got a central estimate and you have a range around that central estimate, even for things which ostensibly are just like Print out the number from a computer and it tells you the number, like how many people are waiting in a queue. Uh, there is there is uh, inherent uncertainty around that number. But the second, I mean, the bigger uncertainty to convey is: does this number mean what we think it means? Uh, and I think it's often the second kind of uncertainty that people get stuck on. It's not, does it mean what we think it's not? Is it how close is it to a true value? The estimate you've produced. Um, that's a, Statistical and very important form of uncertainty, but in broader kind of epistemic uncertainty. I'm going to try that, but I get shot down when you sound like epistemic uncertainty. Yeah, it's the most. So that's, 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 that's my thoughts. Thank, Thank you very much. Opening up, John. Well, um, okay, well.